Um, okay, so I'll just start directly with an example. I'm only going to show fake data in this talk, uh, for which I apologize. I realize that fake data are not uh, believable in many ways. And one of the things I'm going to are, and I'm going to show you, in each case, I'm going to fit the data with models that are wrong. So I'm not doing the cheap thing of making fake data and then fitting the fake data with the models that I use to generate the fake data. So I will be using other models. But I'm only going to show fake data because I want to make very clear points and I want us to be able to check whether things are working. So here's some fake data. This is magnitude on the bottom, and these are numbers of stars in a sample. Uh, the green is the number of stars in some sample, it's a function of magnitude, and the blue is the number of galaxies in the same sample. And this is made up. But this is very characteristic of what you will get at the faint end of pan stars or LSST. There's far more galaxies than stars at the faint end. And despite uh, the last 15 years of astrophysics, some of us still care about the stars. Um, and I'm gonna sh what I'm going to concentrate on is the question, can I find the stars in this sample, given that the galaxies enormously outnumber them? So the first thing you might do if you were trying to find the stars, this is the same sample of data now, but now I've plotted them. I, this is fake data, so I know which side of the stars and which are the galaxies. And I've plotted them here. Magnitude is going this way, and angular size is going this way. And you see... There's a clear stellar sequence, and one of the reasons it's clear is that I've painted it green. <laughs> um, but of course, those aren't the data you get. These are the data you get. And you want to find the stars in the data set, and you want to find the galaxies in the data set. And um, I'm going to come back to this point repeatedly, but one of the key things here is that if you are working at the bleeding edge, and I hope you are, there is no data set that can help you here. You can't use data to help you. Well, you can use some data, and we will talk about what kind of data you can use. But in general, if you're working on pan stars, you're working on pan stars because there is no other data set that answers the question you want to answer. So it's not like you can go to some other data set and find out which are the stars and which are the galaxies. If you could, you should just do your science in that data set. Uh, but you're doing pan stars, you're doing LSST, because there aren't surveys that tell you what's happening at these depths. Okay, so, but you do still know important things. One important thing you know is that galaxies are bigger than stars, angularly, in general. And so you kind of have this sense that the things over here are going to be galaxies, and the things over there are going to be stars. And so a sensible thing to do would be to lay down a vertical line. Hopefully you can see that vertical line. I put a red vertical line there. And you could sweep that line across and find a sweet spot to, at which to separate stars from galaxies. So let's do that. So I'm going to sweep that red line across, and we're going to look at how we do. So here what I've done is, this is where I, I'm sweeping the line. This is, a very narrow, this is very blown up. I'm just sweeping the line across that thin stellar locus. Let me remind you that thin stellar locus is at 1. See, it's right at 1 in this diagram, so you know it's fake data. So here I am sweeping it from 0.9 to 1.3, and the solid line tells you my completeness, meaning if I sweep it over here, I get very high completeness. But the dashed line is showing me the purity of the sample, meaning what fraction of the objects in the sample are in fact stars. And notice there's no place where I can put this line where I both get high completeness and high purity. And that's kind of obvious, because look at the data. The galaxies merge into the stars. And by assumption, all I've got is this information to work on. So I'm stuck. Now, a sensible thing to do would be to just say, well, I just can't get stars in the last magnitude. So I'll just cut it like this. And then I can ask, what do I get if I move the line across? And sure enough, the purity gets a lot better because I'm working at brighter levels. Purity gets better. But the completeness is limited because I've actually chopped out the part of my data which were most expensive to get. Right? So and one thing you can think about is if you're doing this, somebody who's funding your survey could ask you why you needed that extra uh, 2.5 squared or whatever it is. Um, uh, tell us the time. Um, okay, good. So these, I've labeled these plots hard cut, because what did we do in these plots? In these plots, we drew a line and decided to cut it with a line. 
But there are, of course, many other ways we could do our classification. And the question is, if we do better, if we do a more careful job, can we do better? So let's start. So let me make a few comments. So the first comment is, uh, if you're going to classify things, I think you have three, no, three, you have many more than three options. One option you have is to do a hard cut of some kind, what I'm calling hard cut, but what I really mean is heuristic cut. You look at the data, you say, oh, that looks good, we'll work there. So that's what I did there. And of course, I swept through, but I, it was heuristic in the sense that I just decided it would be a vertical line. I could have decided other things. Um, the next option after doing something heuristic like that would be to try likelihood ratios. And I'm going to say what I mean by that in a second, but you basically have a good idea what this is. You have a model for what the stars could look like. You have a model for what the galaxies could look like. And you ask, which is higher likelihood for each object? Okay. Then I'm going to talk, then I will go on to talk a little bit, in fact, in just a minute, about marginalized likelihoods. And this, uh, the difference between a, mar a likelihood and a marginalized likelihood is the following. Say I'm modeling the galaxies in that plot. The galaxies have a finite size. That finite size is a parameter I'm allowed to move around. The stars all have zero size, so the stars I don't have a parameter I'm allowed to move around. That means the star model and the galaxy model have different complexities. They have different amounts of freedom. And if I want to compensate for that extra freedom that the galaxy model has, I have to do something, and that's called marginalization, where I marginalize over. And I'll give you a, we'll talk about this in more detail in a second. The problem with marginalization is it requires you have a prior. So this now splits the other prior, and you can use flat priors here. What astronomers think of as an uninformative choice, but that's almost always wrong as a choice. And then, or you can use in priors that are informed by the data, which I'm going to call the hierarchical. And I will be very clear about what I mean by this, because this is really the point at the top. That if you do this, and you do this, you do much better than you know these. Okay, but I want to say one last thing, which is that probabilistic reasoning, like right, Bayesian reasoning, uh, only gives you probabilities. Bayes' rule, or the likelihood function, or whatever, they just give you probabilities. When you're deciding that something is a star, you're going beyond probabilities. You're deciding to do something. So for instance, in the Sloan survey, when we decided to drill metal, we have big aluminum plates, several of which are sitting out here. We had to decide to drill those holes. We couldn't probabilistically drill those holes. <laughs> um, we actually had to decide to drill those holes. And those decisions, therefore, go beyond probabilities. You needed to do something beyond uh, uh, computing probabilities. You had to make a, take an action based on those probabilities. And I should, before I continue, I should warn Dustin that anything he says can be heard on that video camera. <laughs> um, uh, and so in fact, to make a final decision, in my view, you have to write down your utility, and you have to, given the probabilistic information you get out of this, you have to make the decision which optimizes your utility. And last year, I said that your utility should be your long-term future discounted free cash flow which most people thought was, that changed their lives, basically. And most people who are at that talk aren't at this talk because they now work on Wall Street. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I'm not going to talk about this right now, so I'm just going to postpone that, but I want to leave it as a footnote on the talk that all I'm getting you to is the probabilities. If you actually have to drill metal, you should think about what your utility is. You probably don't want to drill metal on the most most probable quasars. You only want to drill metal on the quasars that are most likely to get you a job or whatever you're looking for. Um, a spouse. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, good. So, what do I want to say? Let me just make sure I'm making my points. Okay, good. A um, uh, couple of things. So, a point that I already made. So, this is kind of this is the outline of the talk. Uh, but let me say a couple things. One thing I already mentioned, which is that 
Um, your data are the best data. If your data are not the best data, reconsider what you're doing. Um, but what I mean by this is, you're not going to go to external data to get your classifications. You're going to have to do it inside your own data. If you're running Gaia, you're going to use the Gaia data to figure out what your, your stars and galaxies are. You're not going to use somebody else's data. It's the best data in the world. Um, so that's a key uh, point. And the, a related point to that, very related to this, is none, or none of your data are labeled. I should say, n I put none in quotes. It is true that you know Sloan Survey has taken spectra of a huge number of objects. So when PanStars operates, a lot of the objects that PanStars images will have SSS spectra. So it's not that none of the PanStars data are labeled with spectra, but the PanStars data that are labeled are, first of all, a very small fraction of the PanStars data, and second of all, a bright part of PanStars, which is not the reason that PanStars are being done. It's the it only it's only the data you kind of care about least are well labeled. So that's one key point. Yes. Staying with the pan stars example and saying I want to separate stars from galaxies. Yes. Um, pan stars has looked at the cosmos field, which goes deeper, better, etc., etc., and is in some sense representative, whatever yes. that means. So, how does the fact that over some subset, you get to look up the true answer coming. I am going to talk about that situation briefly, at the very end. But, but the reason I only talk about it briefly is if you have 100 million photometric measurements, of which 1,000 are labeled, it is very unlikely that your 1,000 labeled objects contain more information about the classes you care about than 100 million. So what we find in practice is that even though you know 0.1% are labeled, it doesn't actually change your answer very much because there's so much more information in the larger data set. Now, there are certainly exceptions to that. If all you care about are radio loud quasars and you only care about bright ones, okay, you, you might want to study them in pan stars. But for generic tasks like star galaxy separation, I think it's true that the pan stars data will crush the cosmos data even though the Cognos data are beautifully laid. But we, that's actually the very question I'm working on right now with uh, Beth Willman. In, um, but I'm not going to show any real data. I want to say one more thing here, which is, I've forgotten. Uh, uh, yes, good, very important point. Um, all models are wrong. <laughs> And you all know this, and you all experience this on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what most people in this room are doing all day, is figuring out why the models are wrong and how they're wrong. But the key thing, this is in two senses that all models are wrong. One sense is there are data that no model can fit. There are data that can't be modeled by your models. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is there are models that fit no data. You know what I mean by those things? Meaning a star, you can make a star formation. You